This month of January is Vision Month. We take time to kind of pull in ranks and huddle and, and uh, look together what God is calling us to be and to do. Next week, we're going to culminate this month. And uh, you'll, if you're here next week, you'll receive a booklet that kind of reviews the previous year and opportunities and challenges for the next year. And then we put the question to everybody, who's in? And uh, we re-up our covenant together, God's people on mission together. So that'll be next Sunday. Uh, that's Vision Sunday. And uh, I want to uh, call your attention to the book of Acts, chapter 8 or chapter 1, then we're going to jump to chapter 8. It's the, the, the official title of the book is The Acts of the Apostles. Now, here's your Greek lesson for this morning. Do, can you read that? Together. Praxis ton apostolon. All right? Now, let, let me make it a little easier to read. Praxis ton apostolon. Now, if you look at that uh, English-sized version of that title, do you see any words in there that look familiar? Praxis would sounds like what? I hear mumble, mumble. Practice, the practices of, tone of the apostolon. That sounds like apostles, plural for apostles. So an apostle means a sent one. So the title of the book is really the practices of the sent ones. So if I were to say to you, turn to chapter one of the practices of the sent ones, now you know what I'm talking about. And by the way, who are the sent ones? It's us. It's all of us. We're the sent ones. All those who come to faith in Jesus now become the sent ones. So I want to take a look at chapter 1, the first eight verses. Now this is Luke writing. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. And he says, in my former book, Theophilus, he's speaking of the Gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After this suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and they asked him a very logical question because they knew a little bit about the scriptures that spoke in the Old Testament of the coming of the kingdom and always referenced the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Those two were, were held together. So he said, Lord, are you at this time going to go to Jerusalem and clean house? Are you going to go set up shop? Is this when it's going to happen? Are you going to take over and drive the Romans out of Israel? That was their understanding. Well, he said to them, it's not for you to know. The times or dates the Father has chosen by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what's that power for? You will be my witnesses. Here in Jerusalem, the surrounding region of Judea, and the next surrounding circle of Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. These were his last words to them, and they were his last words to us. You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. This is basically, if you go back to that verse, this is the summary statement of the book of Acts. If you read the whole book of Acts, that's what it's about, and it follows in that order. It's the table of contents for the book of Acts. In other words, uh, there it is right there. In other words, John R. Stott says, before Christ sent the church into the world, he sent the Spirit into the church. You'll be my witnesses. And so that's what happened. The next chapter, the Holy Spirit came, and they began to bear witness to the resurrected Christ in Jerusalem and Judea, and then the persecution came. You read through that, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then chapter 8, we read how Philip took the gospel to the Samaria, which is the next region. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He took it to Samaria, which is somewhat like a South Korean taking the gospel to North Korea. Be like a Northern Irish Catholic taking the gospel to a Northern Irish Protestant. 
or an Israeli Jew taking the gospel to an Israeli Arab. Pretty significant. And then this happened. So I take your, let's take us to chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. Now keep in mind as we read this story, don't go anywhere, he said. Don't fix anything. Don't scheme anything until you've received the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power to be my witnesses. So here's, here's the example of that power. Now chapter 8, verse 20, uh, 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that leads down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandiki, which is the word is Candace, which means queen of the Ethiopians. He was a eunuch. Now, he could have been a eunuch born that way, most likely he was fixed that way, which was not unusual. Anybody being brought into the royal court, um, they would fix those guys for two reasons. Number one, uh, there'd be less chance of shenanigans. Number two, nobody who was a eunuch could ever qualify to take over the reins of king. So it was kind of protected against a coup in a way. So it's very common in those days. Thankfully, they don't do that today. Otherwise, no one would go to Washington to work. But that's what they did. Are you awake out there? I'm just trying to see if you're listening. Uh, nobody would major in political science. But this guy was really important. He, he had a lot, of, uh, a lot of influence, a lot of power. And he'd gone to Jerusalem to worship, so he was a God-fearer. He, was a, he could have been a converted Jew. And on his way home, he was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. This is a book that was written 700 years before Christ. And the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So Philip ran up to the chariot. Either he was really fast or the chariot was really slow. And as he got there, he heard this guy reading from the prophet, from the prophet Isaiah. And so Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to hop up in the chariot. You see, the Holy Spirit's working here. This is the passage that he was reading. He was reading from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, which is a powerful prophecy of the coming of Christ. And he read these words. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. He was reading all that. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or somebody else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and he told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Now, in your Bible, does anybody have verse 37? Anybody? It's a typo. It's missing. Anybody notice it's not there? Some, trans some manuscripts have a verse 37. I'll tell you what it is. He said, look, who is anything keeping me from being baptized? And that verse 37 in some manuscript says that Philip said, nothing if you truly believe. And then the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's verse 37. That's just for fun. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptized him. Now look at this. This is right out of Star Trek. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went on his way freaked out. <laughs> He's rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared 20 miles north up the coast at Azotus, and then he traveled about preaching in all the villages till he got to Caesarea. So here's a map for those of you who like maps. Jerusalem is the circled city in the middle. The desert road heads southwest to Gaza where this happened, and then Philip was transported to Azotus. You see that? Just 20 miles north, and then he made his way up the coast of Caesarea. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. Folks, Ethiopia in that day was considered the southernmost end of the earth. Now, here's news for you. 
Spring Arbor is now the uttermost ends of the earth. You and I are here because somebody, by the power of the Holy Spirit, bore witness to Christ. Does that do anything for you? I mean, just a little thank you on the side, right? You'll receive power to be my witnesses. Why do we need the Holy Spirit's power? So we can have great Christian experience? So we can feel better? No, so that we can be effective witnesses. What do we need to be effective witnesses? Holy Spirit's power. So let me just unpack this. The Holy Spirit's power of Philip. Do you notice something about the story that the Holy Spirit orchestrated the whole thing? The Holy Spirit's orchestrating the whole thing. First of all, he's preparing the Ethiopian. This guy has developed somehow, maybe it was immediate, maybe it was over time, he's developing a deep hunger for God. He's searching the scriptures. On the other hand, on the other side of the coin, he's directing Philip one step at a time. You notice the Holy Spirit doesn't give Philip every, the whole picture. One step at a time. He says, take the desert road south to Gaza, and he doesn't say anything else. And then once he gets on the road, he gives him the next direction. See that chariot over there? I want you to catch up to that chariot. And even then, Philip doesn't know what's going on in the chariot. Don't you hate that about God? The Holy Spirit never gives us the full picture. If you do this, then this is going to happen, then this is going to happen. What he does, he gives us enough for the day, enough for what he wants us to do, and what are we called to do? Do what Philip did. He was attentive, and he promptly obeyed at every step. It's an amazing example of the Holy Spirit's power to witness. Now, let me just ask the question, what is it about the power? What, what is the power that the Holy Spirit gives? We see this in the story too. So here's the sermon. All that was just, you know, introduction. Here's the sermon. Don't miss it. Number one, the Holy Spirit will give you a heart for his people. He'll give you a compassion for people the way he feels about people. That may come naturally to some, but to others it doesn't, but he will. Secondly, he'll ignite your love for Jesus. Do you love Jesus this morning? Does it come naturally right now where you're sitting or do you have to think about it? Holy Spirit will ignite your gratitude, the humility that comes from, oh my goodness, that he would save me. He will ignite your love for Jesus. Third, he'll lead you to those who already thirst. Meaning God is preparing people. How many of you believe this? God is working all the time. And he's preparing people long before you ever came across them, long before you even think of them. God is already working before you got there. Sometimes I thought that it was up to me to get people to think about Jesus. When I step up here in the pulpit, I say, Lord, what are you already doing in these people? And use me to carry out your sequence, to bring them to the next step. That's how that works. He'll lead you to those who thirst. He'll give you his words. and He'll demonstrate his power. That's the power to witness. All those things are important. It's an amazing thing to be part of what God's doing. How many of you have experienced that? God has led you, maybe brought somebody to your mind. Maybe it's at a workplace. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's at a sports league. Maybe it's that waitress at a restaurant. Maybe it's somebody pumping gas. God prompts you and says, I'm working in that person's life. I want you to go to that person. I remember I was on an airplane with a group of people. I don't know what we were doing. And everybody had tickets up together in the, towards the front of the plane. And my ticket sent me to the back of the plane. And I said, there's something wrong here. I'm supposed to be with this group of people. No, it's not wrong. You just got to go to the back of the plane. It was a full plane. So I went all the way 15, 20 rows back and there was one seat in this full plane and I sat down right next to this Asian gal who was a counselor, counselor psychologist from Denver. And I looked at her and I showed her my ticket. I said, this is a mistake. I'm supposed to be up front, but you know, for some reason I'm up here so I might as well make the most of it. You know, How are you? What's your name? And so you know, we were exchanging small talk and she, she asked me, what do I do for a living? I said, well, if I told you, I'd scare you to death. No, I didn't say that. I have a preacher friend who uses that line. I, I got to think about that. 
He really does. If I told you, it would scare you silly. Instead, I told her I'm a pastor. <laughs> she said, oh, wow, I'm a Buddhist. And so that, we just engaged in this conversation about an hour on the airplane. About, I, and I was just so curious. I said, you know, I read a little bit about Buddhism, but I really don't know a lot about it. Tell me, what does it mean to be a Buddhist? And so she was full of excitement. She was a good evangelist telling me all about Buddhism. And she told me all the background. And then, she, then I said to her, I asked her another question. And I said, well, how does a Buddhist get saved? And she told me. She told me the explanation that, you know, the idea of a God center in Buddhism is this nothingness. And we aspire to this nothingness where we have no longings and no desires. And we reach this place of full contentment. And we, we kind of come to this cosmic center of nothingness. And that's salvation. And I listened to her, and I listened to her, and I, and this came out of nowhere. I, I really didn't, I'm not smart enough to think about Buddhism, but I just asked her this question, and, and I know that God gave me this question. I said, well, tell me, when you get to that place, what happens if when you get there, there's nobody home but you? I didn't come up with that. I mean, it just, and she stopped, and she, she looked at me, and she said, you know, I have been thinking that very thing. How does a Christian get saved? And I told her about the person of Jesus Christ. And heaven is not a loss of personhood. It's the fulfillment of personhood. And we're in the presence of a personal God of love. And she said, I've never read the Bible. She said, do you have a Bible with cliff notes? She really said that. <laughs> so we exchanged addresses, and I sent her an NIV Bible with cliff notes, and we you know, communicated back and forth, and then I didn't hear from her again. And I, hope, I hope I run into DJ in heaven. I mean, I, that God used me, you know, and sometimes I, I think, oh, Mark, you should have kept pressing it. You should have kept pressing it. Have you ever been in a situation where God just changes your ticket and moves you to a different place and points out somebody. Do you know it's possible to get up in the morning and say, Jesus, I know I gotta do this, I gotta do this, but as I go, Philip was on the way to somewhere, as I go, help me to be attentive and responsive that you might be working in somebody's life and you might point me to them just to have an encouraging conversation. It's an amazing way to live. And in most of my life, they're pretty unremarkable, subtle things. And I just always, I say, Ma, I wonder if in those moments when I'm awake and aware, I wonder all the many other moments where I wasn't, I was just into my own stuff. And I blew it. I missed an opportunity. I told you last fall about a dream that I had of a childhood friend and their family. It, it was as vivid. I, this never happened to me before. And I, I, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, but in this dream, in the wee hours of the morning, this person's life was laid out. And just boom, 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 boom. It was just clear as a bell. This person was dying. It was a Saturday morning, and I said, Linda, I, I think I got to get in the car and go to Detroit and, and see this family. And I did. You imagine how nervous I was. The Holy Spirit is arranging things. When I got there, I sat on the front porch of this family. We talked a while, and I, just, I was just out front. I said, I, I don't know what to tell you, except God told me to come. And I shared what he showed me. And I told them, I said, my goodness, God must love you a lot to, to reveal that to me. I shared the gospel with them. She was so spooked. I'm telling you. I said, can I pray with you? She said, no. <laughs> she did, literally, she said, no. The man in the dream died in a couple months. I went to the funeral. And I always wonder, oh, Lord, did I do enough? What would happen if I woke up every morning and said, Jesus, I know you're working in the world where I live and where I work and where I play. And how can you use me to have my antenna up and just notice with the Holy Spirit that's there before I got there and that I would be responsive and simply obedient to whatever prompting you give me? 
There are people in my life who I pray for who are unresponsive. They're just, I'm gonna, they, they just are so cold and I keep praying for them, but I just realize, Lord, yes, I need to keep praying for them, but there are probably many more who are responsive, who you're preparing. And I need to be attentive to those things too. These tend to be people that I know and I'm building a relationship with. But sometimes these are people that are just haphazard random. Either way, the Holy Spirit's working. He'll give you a heart for people. He'll ignite your love for Jesus. He'll lead you to those who thirst. He'll give you his words. He'll demonstrate his power. Over the next month, we wanna, we're going to be putting together some resources to help every one of you become witnesses. He's calling all of us to be witnesses. We exist to bring people to God and help them become fully devoted and reproducing followers of Jesus Christ. We need the Holy Spirit to do that. When was the last time you were attentive and responsive to God to put in a good word for Jesus to somebody? William Arnott, he, this amazing quote, he says, the simple fact that a Christian is still on the earth and not in heaven. You ever wonder that? When you, become, when, you, when you get saved? God, why don't you just beam me up? Save both of us the trouble. You ever wonder why you're still here? William Arnott says, the simple fact that a Christian is on earth and not in heaven is proof that there's something for us to do here. We're left here to bear witness to what Jesus has done in our life. And if we're not doing it, the neglect shows either that we really aren't Christians or we're a Christian who grieves the Lord. The moment we're saved, we are called to be witnesses. You will be witnesses and you will need my Holy Spirit. I'm convinced that most Christians sitting in churches today are closet universalists. What that means is we really don't believe that people have an eternity at stake. We really don't believe that people are lost for eternity without Christ. And the result is a casual approach and a rather apathetic approach. We don't see people the way God sees them. The Holy Spirit, Lord, change us, change us. So I close with this question, why in the world would God want to use me and you, the likes of us, to be witnesses? Like the Ethiopian eunuch, why didn't God just show up next to his chariot and say, hey? And then God reveal himself to Philip, to the Ethiopian. Why doesn't God just cast this huge billboard across every sunset, every night, and say, brought to you by the Lord of hosts? Why doesn't he do that? Why does Jesus use people like us and say, you'll be my witnesses. You ever wonder that question? God would be far more effective at it than I would. Anybody wonder? Are you out there? I'll tell you why. He wants to share his joy with us. The joy of being a part of his eternal enterprise the joy of walking daily in the will of God, the joy someday of going to heaven and there'll be someone who will seek you out and say, hey, you're the reason. What an amazing experience that'll be. Don't go anywhere. Don't fix anything, don't scheme anything, don't improve anything until you receive the Holy Spirit. Because I want you to be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Does anybody want to be a part of that?